All right, so um, good chapter. Again, a very important chapter. And I'll do my best to stick to the workbook, but this <laughs> chapter brings up a lot of questions and a lot of issues. So the Saturday class was feeling very theological. I mean, the, yeah. the, bo the board was just, you know, I needed like two boards. I, I wrote so much stuff. But again, just a lot of good questions, so hopefully we'll have some good discussion tonight as well. And, and again, when you talk, we're in the, uh, the last section of the book where, where we're looking at ecclesiology, which is the study of the church, and eschatology, which is the study of the end times. But both of those uh, things, the church and the study of the end times, have a lot of interlocking parts and a lot of interlocking doctrines. And so there are a lot of churches, like we are a, our background is a Baptist church, a conserv we're a conservative Baptist church. And, um, and so as a result of that, that means that ter even terminology that's used is going to be different. And I actually, I actually think it, it's different from um, the terminology that different churches, you different local churches use is going to be different depending on whether they're more of a Reformed church or a... Uh, so, so pretty much you have Reformed churches and dispensational churches as far as these two doctrines go. And so the Episcopal church, the Lutheran church, even the Catholic church are going to be covenant in their theology by and large. So they're going to use terms like sacrament, we're going to use ordinance. And that, at some point, if I don't address that, bring it up again if I forget. But we talked about it uh, at length on Saturday. And I think it's important just to grasp why are those different terms used and what do they mean. The other thing is, in eschatology, that also comes up in the different churches that you're going to have uh, varying views on Israel and the church depending on the denomination of the church or the background of the church. So the reason I use Grudem, and as a matter of fact in this chapter, um, Grudem is now, <clears throat> it's the first time he's brought up something that I disagree with in the whole book. <laughs> uh, so far I've agreed with everything he said, at least his position. And he, he always tells you what his position is when there are differing views on different subjects. So he is what's called a historic premillennialist. And so is John Piper. And so John Piper and Wayne Grudem are two of my favorite guys. I mean, again, we wouldn't be going through this book if I didn't like Grudem a lot. Um, but I disagree with, on, with him here, and I disagree with John Piper here, but not as much as I disagree with people I even like more than them, <laughs> like R.C. Sproul. Um, I'm in way more agreement with Wayne Grudem than I am with R.C. Sproul. And, um, and I'm in more agreement with, uh, with Grudem than I am with almost all the reformers on their views of the church and the end times because the majority of the reformers are amillennial or postmillennial. And I just totally disagree with them on, the, on that. Now, that doesn't mean they're not Christians. That doesn't mean they don't love Jesus. That doesn't mean they're not smart. Um, there's smart people on all, on all these views and sides, and there's people that love Jesus immensely on all these sides. But the issue always that we're after, I hope, is what's true. <laughs> and does it accord with the scriptures? Can you back up what you believe biblically? And so if any of those guys were in this room, I, I think we could have a cordial dialogue. And, uh, and I'm going <clears> to <throat> treat the different beliefs, hopefully with dignity and respect, uh, and yet agree to disagree. And, and the good news is, you know the quiz, I don't know if any of you took the quiz before this chapter, but if you did, no matter how you did, Aren't you glad that, that however you did on that quiz isn't the basis of getting into heaven or not, or having a relationship with Christ or not? Uh, you know, the fact is the gospel is very simple. It's, it's easy enough that a child can understand it. And yet, it's deep enough that all of us here are on the backside, I think, of 50, at least. I, I think I'm not stretching that. I hope I'm not 
going beneath anybody's age here. But I think we're all over 50 in this room, at least. Uh, but again, we're on the backside, and the reality is um, we're all going to agree and disagree on certain things. But again, as a church, as we call ourselves Marin Bible Church, and I love that name because we're trying to reach Marin for Christ with the Bible, with the message of the Bible. And we want to gather together and have the Bible be our guide. But at the same time, that means we're going to have some we're going to have some dialogue. We're going to have some different views. We're going to have some debate. And that's okay. And hopefully we can do that graciously. So, so that's the goal today. That's the goal tonight. So the, fir the very first question is the one that I immediately disagree with Grudemann. So that's why I wanted to talk about that a little bit. But again, it's, it's what is the church? What is the definition of a church? And there's a sense in which I agree with the, de with the definition, but there's a sense in which I don't. And so I'll, I'll explain that. Okay, so if you look at the blank on page 191, um, the fill in the blanks, there were three blanks. And this is the shortened definition that he gave. And let's see, I think that was on page, yeah, page one, or page one, page 1047. Hey, be proud of yourself. You've read over a thousand pages now. <laughs> so that's pretty good. Not too many people can say they've read a thousand page book. Um, but in, in the definition, in the larger definition, he says there are at least... I want to read what he says here on page 1047, 1047. There are at least two possible, it's the very first uh, paragraph. There are at least two possible definitions of the church. And these two definitions differ over whether the people of God in the Old Testament should be considered part of the church. Uh, the definition that seems preferable to me is this. The church is the community of all true believers for all time. The other definition is this, the church is the community of all true believers since Pentecost. According to this second definition, the church does not include true believers during the time of the Old Testament. So, since you know I disagree with Grudem, <laughs> then you know what my position is. And again, this is something you may have not have spent a lot of time on. I have spent a lot of time on this. Um, but again, it's, it's not crucial as far as your salvation. It's not crucial as to whether you love the Lord or not. I mean, but it is a, an important issue because um, it involves the kingdom of God, the unfolding of the kingdom of God, which is one of the biggest subjects in the Bible. It involves how you view Israel, which is also one of the biggest subjects in the Bible. And it involves the the theology and practice of a local church, which involves every church in the world. So these are big issues. These are important issues. It's not like it's a, a side thing that we shouldn't talk about or concern ourselves with. But I just want you to know that there are not just hundreds, thousands of books on, on just this subject defending one of these two views of the church. And um, so all I can say is, that, is I just want you to know at the outset that I do disagree with Grudem. I love Grudem. He's a great guy. As a matter of fact, the church he goes to now, Scottsdale Bible Church, is just like ours. They, they actually have a different view than what he has, and yet he's still a member at that church. Um, in good standing, by the way. <laughs> okay. But he goes to Scottsdale Bible Church in Arizona. And Scottsdale Bible Church, a very solid biblical church, huge church, church about 10,000 people. Um, but if you go there, um, check and see if he's there, because he teaches a class every Sunday. On, he, he teaches on whatever he's writing on, but he has Parkinson's now. And I don't know, if, I don't think he's writing anymore. Um, that, this was the last final edit he did of one of his books. But he did a whole class on, you can get any of his classes online. He did a whole, he did a book like this on politics, what the Bible has to say about politics, this big, for, for seminary, for his seminary class. It's used as a textbook all over the world, obviously systematic theology. And then he wrote a whole book on ethics that's also this big. And he's written a ton of commentaries and other books as well. But, um, but anyway, in his Sunday school class, what he does is he sort of bridges the seminary and the church and teaches like I do. You know, he, he teaches very theologically and there's a lot of Q&A and, and what have you. But if you go to that church, 
um, that class will have about 400 people in it, and um, and he's just, he's a great teacher and just really you know it's a treat to be able to go there. So if you're ever in Scottsdale, check him out. All right. So the definition he gives, the short definition he gives, is the church is the community of all true believers for all time. And again, so for me, again, there's two two basic types of theology. Uh, there's dispensational theology. <clears throat> and this is for conservative evangelical, you know, people that actually love Jesus and, you know, are, are, are followers of Christ, disciples of Christ, concerned about truth, you know, um, and so forth. I'm not, I'm not looking at liberal theology or um, li you know, I'm not looking at liberation theology or progressive Christianity. I don't think either of those are Christian. Okay. Uh, even if they use the name Christian, they're not, they're not Orthodox Christianity. Um, so you have a dispensational theology and you have covenant theology. And so where this is important concerning the church is in covenant theology, they would view uh, Israel as being replaced by the church. And again, some people would take issue with the way I just said that. Uh, there would be different Diff a variety of views on replacement theology. Some There are covenant theologians that wouldn't adhere to replacement theology and wouldn't like me calling them replacement theologians. But what all covenant theologians agree on is that there's not a distinction between Israel and the church. Okay? So essentially, the easiest way is there's just no distinction between the two. That the people of God in the Old Testament were Israel, and the people of God in the New Testament is, is the church, which consists of both Jews and Gentiles that are converted to Christ. And they, and they don't really make a distinction. They don't really see a plan for Israel. So in dispensational theology, whether it's classical dispensationalism, revised dispensationalism, or progressive dispensationalism, we'll get into all that when we do eschatology, um, it doesn't matter. They all believe there is a distinction between Israel and the church. So that, that's the big difference. When we get down to number four, mm -hmm. there, there are some things in the differences. Right. Yeah. So we'll talk that about. Really. Yeah. Kind of like, how can you go here if you've got. Anyway. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk. Yeah, we'll get there. We'll talk about that. Okay, so, but the big thing is the distinction between Israel and. With reference to Israel, almost always the way a dispensationalist thinks of Israel is in three ways. Ethnic Israel, national Israel, and territorial Israel. So what's the difference between national and territorial? Uh, that, that they have a land, but they also are a nation in the land. Oh, okay. Okay, so, so when, whenever you think of Israel, these, the, a good thing is to think of ENT, ENT Israel. It, they're an ethnic group, they're uh, a nation, and they have a territory. They have boundaries for their nation. And they are, um, so basically the way most, almost anybody defines who's an Israeli, you have a, you have a Jewish mother. If you have a Jewish mother, you're considered Jewish. Okay. So, now, so now, are there exceptions to that? Yes, there are. But that's base, the basic definition of an ethnic Jew. So Israeli and Jewish are different? No. no. Okay. No. No, it would be the same. Okay. So where does um, the religion come in on that? Um, not, not, all, not all ethnic, national, territorial Jews are religious. They're Jewish. Yeah. They would say, I'm Jewish. As a matter of fact, most of you who know Jewish people, most of the Jewish people I know, they're not religious. They're, as a matter of fact, they're usually secular. 
I, I know. And the majority of the 16 million Jews on, uh, that we know of, you know, uh, the estimated 16 million Jews on planet Earth right now are secular. Yeah. But there are Orthodox practicing Jews, there are Reformed Jews, there are liberal Jews, and so forth. Yeah. Okay, so, but in the Bible, uh, again, what we're concerned about is what does the Bible have to say about the church? And when covenant theologians talk about the church, they do not talk really much about Israel today. And they're not particularly that interested in eschatology for the most part. If you go to a Reformed church in general, they're not going to cover eschatology very much. Sometimes, you know, there's exceptions. But whereas in most dispensational churches, they talk about eschatology a lot. Yeah. I mean, it, almost every dispensational pastor loves Revelation, loves Daniel. I mean, they love to talk. And that would include me. I, I love talking about the end times and eschatology. And the reason is because I still believe that God has a, I think that there's a plan, a specific plan for Israel and that has yet to be fulfilled by God. And there's a plan for the church as well. And we'll talk more about that when we get to it. But again, with covenant theologians, they pretty much lump these two together. And with dispensationalists, they make distinctions between these two. So that's why for, the, for dispensationalists, you, we will talk about the rapture. We'll talk about the second coming, and we make a distinction between those two. We talk a lot about the tribulation. And we talk about the millennial kingdom. Covenant people talk a lot about the kingdom, and especially eternity, if they do talk about end time stuff. See, because they don't really see this stuff as that important. The only thing they see coming next is we're, if they believe in, there's still a tribulation in the future, like R.C. Sproul didn't believe in a future tribulation, believe it or not. He believed the tribulation already took place. Uh, he, thinks, he thinks that happened in 70 A.D. Last Days, according to Jesus, is the book he wrote on the end times. It's the only book I, of his I don't recommend. Uh, I recommend every other book he wrote, but I just, don't, I, I just don't think it's a very good book. And I disagree with him wholeheartedly on this. But, um, but he, you know, he doesn't believe in the rapture. He believes in the second coming. I'm talking about Sproul. Um, the tribulation already happened. And he was post-millennial which is interesting. Um, so he believed that there would be a great revival in the future and that that would usher in the second coming. So again, we'll get to a lot of that stuff, of course, when we get to the end times. But, but for now, just to not, I don't want to confuse you too much and, and give too much to you, but just, just to say that when you think of churches, they fall under evangelical gospel teaching churches fall under covenant theology or dispensational theology. And if you ever leave here and you want to find a church you want to know, just ask the pastor, um, do you believe that there's a distinction between the church and Israel or they're the same? And you'll find out immediately whether they're a covenant theologian or a dispensational theologian. And if they don't know, leave the church right away because that means they don't know theology at all. <laughs> okay, because this is... This is uh, Church 101 or Eschatology 101. I mean, uh, uh, you know, 19-year-old Bible college students know this stuff. Okay, so, um, yeah. This supersessionism yeah. would be something under the covenant. Yes. Yeah, so the, these guys are known as supersessionists. And there's a variety of those views, which isn't really relevant right now because that, that has to deal with uh, eschatology. And they're also known as replacement. Um, replacement. Replacement theology as well. They, both those names. Um, and, and again, you know, this used to be a super hostile topic. It's not as hostile now. So that's a good thing. And, and the reason is because the people that were way over here and way over there have come more towards the middle. And so Grudem, as a historic premillennialist, he would be more in the middle. He would be more a centrist. 
sort of like a libertarian in politics. You know, you wouldn't be a Republican or a Democrat, but you sort of be like, a, I like some of these things over here, and I like some, and I'm, you know, I'm sort of in the middle here on, on this. Uh, that would be sort of, I, I think a lot of theologians today would, would be more in the middle. They're not as extreme. And to me, that's a good thing because they're listening to each other and they're not talking past each other. They're, they're dealing with the real stuff, the hard issues. So that's a good thing. All right. Um, so again, our church is dispensational, um, but we welcome people who have a covenant background or have never wrestled with this. We want you to wrestle with it, and that's why we talk about it, and that's okay. And, uh, and you could even be, I mean, we have people that are members that are covenant in their theology, and that's okay, you know. Um, and so we welcome it, but I don't, you know, I don't tell them, I don't tell them what they want to hear. Uh, if, if people are on that side, I, I like to talk about it and debate it and say, hey, read this book and hey, what do you have to say about this? So anyway, it, it's good. Um, but we are, we do believe that God has a future program for ethnic, national, territorial Israel. And so we believe, and that why this is relevant to the church is because we believe this makes more sense of the end times unfolding that the rapture is coming not for Israel but for the church but that means that people that are is are Jewish that are believers like Spencer and Marty Shear in our church um, they will be raptured even though they're Jewish okay um, but people that are Jewish that have yet to be part of the remnant many of those people will be said the reason for the tribulation is both the wrath of God being poured out on planet Earth as punishment for all the sin that's going on. But also, there'll be a, a, a big remnant that's saved. And I do believe that the two witnesses in the book of Revelation that are coming are going to be Jewish. They're going to be Enoch and Elijah. And there is, there's a lot of reasons I believe they're going to be Enoch and Elijah. But for one is they don't have the glorified bodies yet. So, um, so uh, for instance... Um, glorified bodies aren't going to happen until the millennial kingdom. Okay. Now we'll get our glorified bodies in heaven before the millennial kingdom during the rapture, but we're not going to be on earth yet. So anybody who isn't raptured before the tribulation and enters into the tribulation will not have a glorified body. That's why it makes sense that Elijah and Enoch will be those two witnesses, I think. And then, um, uh, we'll come back at the end of the tribulation. That would be the second coming. And so that's the church, but then the church comes and you have this huge remnant of Israel. So you have all these Jewish people that have been saved that enter into the millennial kingdom along with uh, many Gentiles like us who then have glorified bodies entering into the millennial kingdom. But you're going to have people that... Uh, uh, you know, the, the people that do have children without their glorified bodies, uh, many of those children ultimately will rebel. You're going to have a final rebellion after the thousand, you know, at the end of the thousand years. And that's where the covenant people start pretty much with, we all agree, we both agree to wholeheartedly on heaven and hell, the last judgment. Um, so there's a lot we agree on. But it's sort of this stuff. It's this stuff. It's what do we do with Israel? How does that make sense of these things? And there's great disagreement on those, those issues. Okay? So any questions on that? I, I, I can understand the, the, the distinctions, but are you saying that the covenantal churches do not agree with the dispensation of God's revelation of wisdom to the church? Um, again, it depends on it depends on the passage. It depends on it, the specifics. But I, again, most covenant again all the covenant guys I know that know theology, we agree on a lot. I mean, there's there's just few things we disagree on, and and on both sides they're not. You get your occasional guy that's sort of a uh, you know won't back down or is pretty hardcore. But for the most part, most people are pretty. I'm willing to. Uh, you know, and even I would say I, I'm pretty sure I'm right, but I but I'm not like I wouldn't say I'm 100 percent right on this. I could be wrong. And that would really bother me if I was. <laughs> but but again, at this point in my study, I just see I see more pros than cons with this position biblically. 
and theologically. Like yeah, yeah, I just think I have less problems yeah, you've got to do a lot than of that, with, yeah. especially with the millennium. I, I think, man, alive, uh, you read an amillennialist on Revelation 20 and uh, it, it's, it, it, it's re really hard to understand. I mean, they have to do a lot of gymna hermeneutical gymnastics, is what I call it. But again, there's really good, uh, you know, G.I. Packer and, you know, there's some great amillennial guys, uh, uh, John Stott. I mean, you know, these guys are great theologians. Um, so anyway, that's that. Um, but again, I think it's important to, as we're talking about this, he, he, what, what Grudem is concerned about primarily is that there's not, and what a lot of the covenant theologians don't like is this idea that there's two peoples of God. So they make a big deal about that. And for me, it's, I, I just don't see it as a problem. I see it as, see, you have God dealing with Israel, so he's dealing with a nation. The reality, though, is they failed miserably, okay? Even today, they're failing miserably as a nation. Uh, they're primarily secular. You know, they're, most of the people over there, it's about money, it's about power, it's about control, whatever. There aren't that many people that are really concerned about the kingdom of God in Israel. Or for that matter, even the church in America isn't that concerned about the kingdom of God either. You know, so uh, there's plenty of blame to go around. But the issue is, what, what does the Bible say? And what the Bible is concerned about is that the kingdom, we're to pray that, the ki that your kingdom come, your will be done. And so what, in the middle of that, what's, what's happened that's really good is a lot of dispensationalists used to only focus on the future and the future kingdom. But now a lot of them are agreeing that the kingdom is already and it's not yet. And they're saying the king, their emphasis is the kingdom is already. And especially if you're post-millennial, you're ushering in the kingdom through righteousness and through the nations. So there's a lot at stake. There's a lot of different uh, discussions that are taking place on this. But where there is a lot of agreement is that there's, uh, there's a lot more agreement now that the kingdom is already in the sense where the church makes a difference where it is. Like when in, John, in Northampton, in Jonathan Edwards' days, um, there, was a, there was a famous bar, apparently, in Northampton that a lot of people would go to and get drunk at, and then people would be passed out outside the, the bar and, you know, out of the bar on the way to their farm and what have you. And during the Great Awakening, so many people got saved that the bar had to shut down mm -hmm. because people just weren't going there to get drunk anymore. And that's a case where people got saved they became a part of the church, and then the church influenced society. Okay? And that's why it's important that the church is holy and different and unlike culture, because we can impact culture. The, 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 when a church becomes like the world, that's really bad in both ways. It's bad for the church and it's bad for the world, because that means the gospel isn't transforming lives. But all of us, we've seen transformation in our own lives from the gospel. And then God's used us in other people's lives to bring about transformation in their lives through our teaching and modeling. And then it makes a difference. As there's more and more Christians, it, it gets more and more influence in culture. So both views are, are concerned about the kingdom and want to see God's kingdom work done on earth. But the covenant view is that Ultimately, the kingdom won't come in its, in its fullness until heaven, whereas in the dispensational view, the, king, the kingdom will come in its fullness on earth even before heaven. So there's like the, the earthly stage, the millennial stage, and then the heavenly stage, whereas in the covenant view, there's just the earthly stage and the heavenly stage, in essence, with the exception of post-millennialists. <laughs> okay, there's always an exception. Okay, number two was true or false, ecclesia is a Greek term that refers to the building that the church meets in. False. Yeah, that was false. Um, and again, there's a lot of people, I, I bet, that think that. Right. You know, yes. It's that church over there, you know. And, and again, we, we do that. We, we say, where, you know, where do you go to church? Marin Bible Church. But technically, 
um, if you were to answer like as specifically correctly as you could, you would say, well, I am a part of a body of believers in Marin called Marin Bible Church. And I'm part of that body. Yeah. Yeah, we meet at a building over on, you know, North, uh, what street are we on? North, Third San Pedro or Third, Third North San Pedro, whatever it is. Um, but yeah, when I think of the church, though, I think of individual people that make up the church. Okay. Um, all right. What does Grudem mean when he says that the church is both visible and invisible? And he gave two simple definitions of that. But if any of you want to expound upon it. Invisible church is the church as Christians see it on earth. Right. The invisible church is the church as God sees it. Right. Good. In the heart. Yeah. And again, it'd be nice if we could see that too. <laughs> but again, when his disciples asked Jesus, you know, how are we going to know that people are your followers? He said, you'll know them by their fruit. So really, we, we, if, we know, if we're going to... If we're going to believe that people are part of the church, we need to be fruit inspectors. <laughs> uh, you know, they have agricultural inspections. We, we do uh, fruit inspections. Um, and that's what we're told. You know, that the only way you could really know someone's a Christian is whether they have the fruit of the Spirit. And, uh, but again, even there, you don't really know. Only God does. And I believe we're all going to get to heaven. Um, and it's probably going to be surprising to all of us who's there and who's not there. Um, because, again, only God sees um, the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. Okay, what um, are the similarities and differences between the church and Israel? So, again, we've already talked about a few of those, but what else, uh, anything else that you guys had well, that you saw? I wrote down both are chosen people. Mm -hmm. Israel is a chosen nation, but the church is chosen individuals. Okay. Um, Israel has earthly promises and the church has more heavenly promises. Um, both are part of the kingdom of God. Um, Israel needed a priest to mediate with God, at, but the church, all are priests. Um, but both are fellow heirs of God's kingdom. Good. That's a lot of good, a lot of good points you got there. Good. Thanks. Anyone else come out with uh, some differences and or similarities? Israel gets, okay. Oh, go ahead, Charlie. Israel gets earthly blessings and the church gets heavenly blessings. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, good. And any, any other ones? Uh, the Jewish believers will be grafted back into the church. Into right. The right. Yeah. Okay, good. And again, it's a huge subject. Um, there's whole books on this. I, I always throw this out there, if, if any of you are brave enough to read it, The Greatness of the Kingdom by Alva J. McLean. One of the best books of the 20th century, one of the best theological works of the 20, 20th century that's completely unsung. Hardly anybody knows about it. But anybody who's read it, and some of the most brilliant theologians of the 20th century who, ha who did read it say they thought it was the most important book of the 20th century. It's a hard book to read. <laughs> it's very theological. Um, but if you really want to dive into the whole idea of the kingdom, that, that is, that's a primary source. I mean, he, he really did great work on that subject. Um, yeah, so, uh, and, and again, you know, like one of the things to think about, too, is that I, I am a part of the church. I am not a part of Israel. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, but there are people in our church who are both. Yeah. Yeah. And so you can't be a part of the plan of God for Israel unless you're Jewish. Mm -hmm. And in particular, you have to be part of the remnant on top of it. Uh, but... Jewish people, both in the tribulation and the millennial, will, will benefit from God's plan. As a matter of fact, there are already Jewish people benefiting. You know, even as hard as it is in Israel, it's still a pretty important nation in a lot of different ways. Yeah. And there's a lot of blessing that comes on Israel despite, you know, all the stuff going on over there all the time. Um, and, and again, when I study Israel's history, I think it's one of the greatest apologetics 
for the existence of God. Uh, that Israel is a nation. I mean, it's an amazing thing. And, and when you study the history behind it, there's a lot of miracles. There's a lot of history that has to come together, a lot of different people, a lot of different events. And I don't think, I don't think any human being could have orchestrated that. Uh, I think it's totally out of the orchestration of God. And, and it also gives me hope for all this stuff that's still prophesied, because I, think it, I believe it's going to happen, because I've already seen this kind of stuff happen that have been prophesied from the Old Testament. Okay, so the next question relates to what are the similarities and differences between the church and the kingdom of God? So what was his definition of the kingdom? He had a simple definition. Did anybody get that? The kingdom is the rule of God. Yeah, it's the kingly rule of God, he said. And that's important because... Um, one of the main prophecies of the Old Testament is that someone's going to come in the line of David and sit on the throne of David as the king of Israel. And so you have the Davidic covenant that dispensationalists believe will be fulfilled when Jesus comes back and he sits on the throne in Jerusalem. Okay. Um, so we, we believe that. I believe that. I believe that, that Jesus is going to literally come back to planet Earth and sit on a throne and rule as king um, in real time <laughs> on the Earth for a thousand years before the kingdom. And all dispensationalists hold to that. Um, most covenant people don't hold to that. As a matter of fact, uh, Grudem does. So, so they're, they're interesting because they're sort of, they're sort of right here. <laughs> Piper and, Piper and Grudem are here uh, because they believe a lot of this stuff, but they believe a lot of this stuff too. But what they do believe is they do believe in a literal thousand year millennium, but they don't believe, they still don't believe there's going to be distinctions between Israel and the church. But they do believe that, day, that Jesus is going to sit on the throne and he's going to rule. But they just believe that there's one, you know, that the church has replaced Israel to some extent. Okay. Um, the church is also the community of the kingdom, but is never the kingdom itself. Yeah, that's, an, that's another important point he said. Uh, that, that Americans have a hard time with the kingdom thing because mm -hmm. we don't have a monarch. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're kind of anti-monarchical. Monarchical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah. That yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, especially the first ones that came from England, right? Yeah. <laughs> we have no, we serve no sovereign here. Was the yeah. one of the mottos of early Americans? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, George Eldon Ladd had some good points, and I don't remember what pages it is, but I wrote it on my uh, in, in my workbook that. He said the church is not the kingdom, that the kingdom creates the church, that the church witnesses to the kingdom, that the church is the instrument of the kingdom, and the church is the custodian of the kingdom, and therefore the church influences the kingdom. Okay. 1058. 1058 is where that is? Yeah. So I thought those were good things. By the way, George Eldon Ladd is, it was... Ladd would be here too, and Ladd was very influential in Grudem's eschatology as well as Piper's. And he influenced me quite a bit for a few years. I, I was historic pre mill for about 12 years in my pastorate. Uh, I, held, I held Grudem's view. Now, not to the extent, I still believe there was a distinction between church more so than Ladd or Piper or whatever. But I did believe we were going to go through the tribulation. I, I associated the rapture and the second coming as one event. Um, and then in my doctoral program, I had to read all the best books by all the f five different major views. And uh, I had to read the top four books on each one and write a report on each one. And then I write, had to write a hundred page paper defending my position. And I came back around to this. <laughs> I came back around to my original position. So I'm glad I, I'm glad I had the opportunity to study all that very thoroughly and, and have one of the finest theologians in the world teaching the class, uh, Dr. Robert Sosi. Um, 
he did a, he, he did a tremendous amount of work on progress uh, on really getting progressive dispensationalism on the map and now most dispensationalists are progressive dispensationalists so the the primary view of this uh, is not classical or revised it's progressive and Dallas Seminary that really is the seminary that developed this to more than any other seminary the majority of the faculty now are progressive dispensationalists all right, um, number six, the Reformation understanding of the marks of a true church are what? C. C, which is word and sacrament. sacrament. Okay, here's another pet peeve of mine. <laughs> so, another thing that, that I, another word I just don't like is the word sacrament. I'm going to tell you what. So, let me get rid of this. Okay, so um, we're, we're doing a thing in Catholic, those of you who are in Deeper Dive, we're going through Catholicism, and I think all of you are in Deeper Dive. Um, I'm going through Catholicism when I'm not doing a great book of the month or a habit of Jesus during the month. But next week we're doing, Wimp or this Sunday we're doing Wimpy Week and what? How many of you are reading that? I hope you're reading it. It is a great book. First Incredible book. book. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it is just an amazing book. But anyway, we're going to cover that book, but then we're going to get back to Catholicism. And so one of the things that we're going to cover one of the weeks we do Catholicism, we're going to cover the seven sacraments. I'm not going to do it here, but, but I just want to say that the, the Catholic Church has seven sacraments. Okay. And I'm not going to list those here. But two of, the or two of the sacraments that the Catholic Church does, Protestant churches do. And that would be baptism and communion, what they call the Mass or the Lord's Supper. Communion. We also call it the Lord's Supper as well. Okay, so we call these, our church calls these ordinances. Okay, and we do baptism. Now, we specifically do credo baptism or believer's baptism. It's the same thing. They do infant baptism. All covenant churches do infant baptism. Some covenant churches do both. Okay, now, here's the difference. Here's the bottom line difference. Actually, I'll let you, maybe you know. Okay. What is the difference between a sacrament and an ordinance? What do you think? Well, Jesus, um, um, started the ordinances. Of course, in the sacraments, Jesus, you know, those are included in the. An ordinance the is a command of Jesus. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this means command. Now, we also have the command to fulfill the Great Commission, to go and make disciples. That's a command as well. But that's not considered an ordinance, okay? And that's, that's another discussion. I don't want to get into that right now. But that's another discussion. But I just want to talk about the difference between a sacrament and an ordinance. A sacrament, uh, especially as seen by the Catholic Church, means that there's something in doing the sacrament that gives forth grace mm -hmm. to the action. So, when it, so the first thing a Catholic does, if you're Catholic, the very first thing you want to do is you want to baptize, when you have children, you want to baptize them. Yeah. Why? Because what you believe is you believe there's grace infused into you by doing the very sacrament itself. They believe the same thing with the Mass. With all the sacraments that they do, they believe that by doing that, there's something in that sacrament that provides grace just by doing it. So it's like works. Absolutely. Exactly. It's absolutely works, yeah. Exactly. Um, and, and, that's, and that would be another distinction. This, this is all by God's grace, and this is by works. And all the seven sacraments, which again we'll get into in our study on Catholicism, we're going to break down, we're going to do a whole session on the sacraments. I'm going to show what they teach, what the catechism teaches, the official catechism of the Catholic Church, and then what the Bible teaches. 
and you'll see how the Bible is radically different than the seven different sacraments. Um, but see, with baptism and uh, communion, or the Lord's Supper, We, we simply believe these are symbolic. Yeah. Now, is Eucharist a Catholic word? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, uh, Prote I mean, Protestants use it too. Okay. Usually, Episcopalians like they like they like calling it the Eucharist. Yeah. It's just, it, it, I mean, it, it's no different. It, it's, it's the same idea that there's something by doing it that infuses grace into you. By just the, by the very sacrament itself. So the sacraments um, produce grace, where grace produces the ordinance. I think that's a well put. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. And so, so when we do a baptism, you know, Jim usually does the baptisms here. He just likes to get wet. <laughs> yeah. He, just he doesn't mind getting wet as much as I do. So. I let him do the baptism. But anyway, he usually does the baptisms. It's really for logistic reasons. Um, but, but bottom line, you know, he, he does a good job of explaining baptism when he's up there. And he always says, this, is, this doesn't save you. Uh, what, this, what they're doing is they're testifying to the fact that they're saved. Um, so grace has already been bestowed upon you in salvation. And this is mere, these things, both these things, are merely symbolic mm -hmm. of what's already happened to you. You're already saved, and you're doing this out of obedience mm -hmm. to Christ's command to do it. And that's why we do it, okay, just out of obedience. But we don't believe there's, any ma there's nothing magical in baptism. There's nothing magical in taking the Lord's Supper. It's merely symbolic, an outward uh, thing that we do that is symbolic of an inward reality of the fact that God has saved us by grace through faith. But the sacraments are all a work mm -hmm. that we do. And when we do these works, we earn grace. Mm -hmm. earn grace. Yeah. Earn Every grace. step of the way. It's not yeah. grace if you earn it. You go ahead and talk to your Catholic friends about that. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. Yeah, we'll get into that. But again, that's, that's the thing. That's why it's important, though, that um, what you have a really good grasp of definitions. And that's why we don't use sacrament, because sacrament, honestly, I think it's a bad word. It, it can, it, it's, it's not true. So for me to do a sacrament would go contrary to my conscience. Because I don't believe that by getting, baptiz, get, getting baptized that I'm doing a work. I, all, I, all I'm doing is I'm, I'm being obedient to what God is telling me to do. But this is an act out of obedience to God that has absol is not bestowing any grace on me in any way. I've already been graced by God yeah. through salvation. Okay. Can I read the definition yeah. of sure. sacrament? Yeah. The yeah. Sacrament. In Protestant teaching, a ceremony or rite that the church observes as a sign of God's grace and as one means by which those who are already justified receive God's continuing grace in their lives. The two Protestant sacraments are baptism and the Lord's Supper. In Roman Catholic teaching, there are seven sacraments, and they are understood as a necessary means of conveying saving grace. And then it says, see also ordinance. Yeah. And again, I just don't like using the term sacrament because it's confusing. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with infant baptism. You know, we do baby dedications. Right. And so sometimes they say, well, there's nothing about baby dedications in the Bible. Um, but there's nothing against it either. <laughs> you know, so, you know, what do we do when we do a baby dedication? We're, we're saying we're coming along the family. We're going to pray for your child. We're going to do the best we can to teach your child. And we want you to teach your child in the ways of the Lord. Train them up in the ways of the Lord. We, our hope is that they're going to come to salvation one day. And we just want to come behind you and encourage you and help you. There's nothing either for or against it, biblically. I, I, I think it's just, there's no command to do it. But in infant baptism, when you do an infant baptism, it's very confusing. Because mm -hmm. what are you doing? Mm -hmm. 
When I was a pastor in San Diego, I got calls all the time from Catholics wanting me to baptize their children. And they'd say, when can we, you know, when can we do an infant baptism at your church? And I said, I always wanted to say never, <laughs> but I, you know, I, was, I was nicer than that on the phone. Um, but I'd say, well, can I ask you a question? You know, why, are you, why do you want to baptize your infant? And they were always, there was always silence. Well, won't my child be saved if I do that? And I say, well, no. I mean, the Bible doesn't say that. I go, do you want to do what the Bible wants you to do? Yeah. They would always say, yeah. Okay, well, let me tell you what the Bible teaches about baptism. And then I'd read a few passages on baptism and I'd say, but that sounds like they're adults. And I said, you're right. <laughs> These are people that already believe. But see, in their mind, why were they doing it? They, I mean, they were nice people. They, were, they wanted to do the right thing. They're good. These are good people, good intentioned people. But they're not doing what the Bible says. They're doing something basically out of tradition. Yes. This is what's expected of me as a Catholic yeah. to do. But they don't know why they're doing it. Well, so, so when I, I interviewed... Well, if they're Catholic, why are they Catholic <laughs> Protestant church? Yeah, that's a good question. We, we just happen to be in a very Hispanic area. Yeah. And... You know, we were close to whoever was calling, I, was I think. taught that if yeah. the baby died and had not been baptized, that baby would go to hell. Yeah, the Catholic Church. So we were told yeah. that you have to make sure your baby is baptized as soon as possible yeah. in order to go to heaven. So the sacraments, yeah. each one was like another layer. Right. Yeah. You had to keep yeah. fixing these because yeah. it's not... I wasn't taught about grace. I was taught that this makes you someone who is deserving of heaven. Mm -hmm. Right. They had to do each one. Yeah. Things, yeah. That they were all important. They were sacraments. Yeah. And they were works. Yeah. <laughs> and again, that's why I like, you know, because again, the way, Gr if Grudem used it, the way you read it, his definition in the back, I would agree with. But again, I, I will not use the term sacrament because it is so associated with the Catholic Church and works. And I just think ordinance is, is a good enough word. <laughs> um, so, so again, though, it is, it is yeah. Too, that, um, if you want to become Catholic, there's a very lengthy process you have to go through of taking classes mm -hmm. and studying and learning mm -hmm. unless you're baptized. Oh. If you're baptized... Really? Total shortcut, go to the front of the line, skip all the classes. Like baptized as an infant? Baptized as in anybody, yeah. Oh, well, even I don't know as about an infant, infant, but I'm a, I'm a Protestant. If you're baptized in a Protestant church. That counts. That counts. That's that why it that? counted for Becca, our daughter Mary Doug, mm -hmm. who was Catholic. And I remember the priest contacting us for the baptism records. Well, we didn't keep oh, good baptism, baptism records. <laughs> I always wondered. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Charlie. This They've been married, what, 10, 11 years, 12 years. Anyway, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. that Because I kept like, what is, he, what is this big deal about this? It was a really big deal to them. And I had yeah. to meet with the priest in there and all this stuff. And that's interesting. So, okay, yeah. I got that long... Years long wait question answer. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so so again, we'll, we'll look at that more when we, as we get back into Catholicism. But um, again, at, for us, we call baptism and the Lord's Supper simply ordinances. Mm -hmm. We don't want confusion. And we really want to emphasize, you know, that um, God gets all the glory in our salvation. What, what do we bring to the table? Our sin. We don't bring any works at all. And, but he helps us to do good works, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in him, Ephesians 2.10. Okay, and then word, um, you know, so the understanding of the marks of the true church, again, there's more than these, but these are very important. These need to be central. And so in our church, um, there are churches where you'll see the communion table higher than the preaching, than the pulpit. Mm. Very Catholic. That would be very Catholic. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but Prot that's one of the things the Protestant churches did differently is the pulpit now became the center of the service okay. and the word became more important than the liturgy or the word, the basis of the liturgy was the word. Yeah. So uh, when you go to a Christian church, you know, the, 
usually when, like the first time any Catholic comes to us who's never been to a Protestant church, they're blown away by how much time we spend in the Bible. Always. Uh, that's the first thing they notice. It's like, wow, I learned more about the Bible today than I have in the last 10 years. You know, um, it, it's just radically different because the, in the Catholic Church, it's all liturgy pretty much. It's tradition. There's traditions, liturgy, and if it's in Latin, nobody even knows what's going on. You know. My mother-in-law, um, good Italian Catholic, she started reading her uh, Bible probably when she was in, in her eighties. Oh wow! And she got so mad at the Catholic Church for lying to her, saying, "This says that Jesus had brothers and sisters." They lied to me. Oh, <laughs> yeah. oh gosh, she was so mad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, the book of the month, the biography of the month is Chris Castaldo's, I think it's called Holy Ground. I'm almost done with it. It's a really good book. Um, he does a great job of, you know, he was Catholic. Uh, he's now a pastor at Wheaton Bible Church where Kent Hughes was out for many years. It's one of the most popular, one of the most famous churches in the Chicago area, of evangel solid evangelical church. But anyway, he's on staff there. But he tells story after story of ex-Catholics, and uh, the number one thing that Catholics say that have become Protestants is, I never had a clear understanding of the gospel. Yeah, this is the number one thing. But the number two thing is, uh, we never really studied the Bible. And so those two things. And that's what we do. I mean, that's what we focus on. The God, you, get, you get the gospel every week. And you're going to get a lot of Bible every week. And so again, if you're getting a lot of Bible and a lot of gospel, uh, obviously you're going to see more people get saved. You're, I, was, I was talking to Christine Tang this morning. And uh, she's in Bible Study Fellowship, and she's a really good friend of mine. And, and she was saying that your sermon at George's memorial was the best wow. sermon she had ever heard at any funeral, any time, wow. anywhere. Wow. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Um, yeah. Well, you know, and again, I, I well, I, again, I, yeah, it was easy. That was I, I asked easy. For the gospel you gave me. It's easy when I have, especially the your blessing to go for it, but. But no, I always preach the gospel at funerals. And you even had, I did a funeral for your friend who somebody got really mad at her. I know you remember that. Uh, they got really upset, you know, for, for me sharing the gospel. But again, I'm, I'm responsible to God. And I can't help people. How are you going to help people deal with death without the gospel? You know, so anyway. All right. Um, yeah, so word and, word and, I would say, ordinances. I like that word better. But the Reformers did use the sacrament. You've got to remember, they're just coming out of the Catholic Church, so they didn't make, they didn't make a gazillion changes right away. They, they were already rocking the boat as it was. Okay, um, thinking critically, what are metaphors for the church that the Bible uses that are especially helpful in the society in which, in which we live? So what, what stood out to you guys? Um, certainly family. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Branches in the vine. Yeah. The body of Christ. Uh, yeah, why would those be particularly important in, in, in our society today? Let's take, fam let's take family, for instance. Most people have some sense of what family is. Mm -hmm. Now, some of the agricultural illusions people don't know. may not yeah. know. Gardeners. Although we all benefit from, yeah, right. <laughs> we all eat food. We all eat this stuff. Yeah, yeah. gardeners are more likely right. to really, uh, yeah, identify with that. Um, right. And again, of course, all these are coming out of an, uh, an agricultural society. Right. They weren't industrialized. And bride <clears throat> is becoming less relative in our society than it used to. You mean relevant? Real. Yeah. And that I think that um, God's house does, because people understand about building yeah. and having a builder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. What, what are some of the, um, what do you see are sort of the key themes with all these metaphors? 
Like what, what are two or three key themes that you see with all of them? Where they all have the same elements? God's the source. Okay. I see relationship. I see yeah. bond. Mm -hmm. um, I see a, uh, yeah. They're all producing something. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah, that's a big one. Um, and, and in almost all of them, the body, a house, uh, branches, olive trees, harvest, temple, field of crops, it, it involves, it's almost like one thing, but there's a lot of elements to that oh, thing. Okay, yeah. um, and again, like you're, you're right, I mean, the, the whole goal of all of this is that it's built up, it expands, it produces. Um, but again, it, it can't do that without unity, and it says that it's based on truth. So again, the Word. Mm -hmm. You know, we get truth from the Word. And if we agree on that's why it's important that a church, that's why important we, we have a membership class, because we don't want anyone becoming a member who disagrees with our, what we believe. What, what are we saying? You know, what's our message? You, you need to agree with our message. But then you also agree with how we do it, because that's what unifies us. You know, if it, there's a lot of ways to do evangelism, but if somebody comes here and wants to take and says, we need, we, everybody in the church needs to do door to door evangelism. Well, that might be fine. You know, if you want to do that, go for it. You know, I mean, by all means, I, I'd rather have somebody doing door to door, door, door evangelism than no evangelism. But if they're so set on doing that that they want everybody to do it and they get upset if we don't do it, well, now we're going to go out to the woodshed, you know, I mean, but that happens a lot. In a lot of churches, and, and in our church, it happens a lot with different things. You know, people will come from another church. Have you ever considered doing this? Right. Well, yeah. Um, why don't you do it? Well, we don't have anybody to lead it. <laughs> and we don't have a lot of, that takes a lot of people. There's certain, you know, like Vacation Bible School takes a lot of work and a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And the reason we haven't done it last year, we don't have the leadership or the workers. If we did, we would. It's great. It's a, it's a great thing to do, but you got to have the people and you got to have somebody that leads it. Somebody that's a point person. Do it. it takes a lot out. Dana's done it a bunch of times. You know, I'm a widow for four months, you know, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, so, you know, the reality is that there's a lot of good things we could be doing, but what we're focused on is we're trying to make it, we're trying to make our church simple. Get into a group, where you're being encouraged around the word, praying together, encouraging each other, and use your gifts in ministry. And be here every week. You know, be here to support the church. You know, be here to be a part of the church. And if everybody does that, our church is really healthy. If we don't have a lot of people doing that, our church is unhealthy. And it's really that simple. But again, there's always going to be different people with different gifts that come along the way that may start, you know, like right now we don't have like a homeless ministry. Right. But there, we could get somebody down the road who's really is good at that, has a passion for that, has a heart for that, can recruit some people, and we can help homeless people better than we do. Um, that can start in the life groups, right. you know. Yeah, they absolutely. That they are like-minded in something yeah. and they want to. Yeah, absolutely. But one thing we'll always do is we're always going to do baptisms. We're always going to do the Lord's Supper. We do it every week. And we're always going to preach the Word. Mm -hmm. And, and, and then we're going to try to encourage people to use the gifts that God's given us and get together and do evangelism and discipleship and so forth. But, but again, um, it, it's really easy for a church to get off track on. I mean, liberal churches don't, don't do the word right. well. They do social justice really well, typically. Right. But again, if people are still going to hell, they, if, if they're not saved... Are you really hell? They still die and they're still going to hell. They need to be saved. And so that's why the word is just so important. Okay, um, number eight was what are metaphors for the church that the Bible uses that are particularly difficult to understand in the society? And you said agricultural because most of our people are, in, are tech, you know, tech and industry and stuff. We still can understand the concepts. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the temple metaphor too is doesn't work really well in our society because there isn't that whole sacrificial system that it really talks about. Um, and the, the priesthood that it 
that uh, yeah that is I remember when I became a believer I was like what I never heard of any of that so that was like I had to learn yeah you'd have to explain that, it because I didn't understand you know I didn't understand a lot of I this. think too the reason you know the reason there's so many metaphors for the church probably you know God God's smart <laughs> nobody's smarter than God and he knew the word had to go all over the world like until he returns again. But it, it really is amazing that all of the we, we could we could explain all of these, yeah. whether you're a farmer or not. You know, whether in, in other words, every single one of these metaphors are pretty clear, pretty specific, pretty clear, still relevant, still important. And even like family, you know, you know, fa fam the our our society is trying to create different kinds of family, different kinds of marriages, different kinds yeah, of families, whatever. Right. But, but the reality is there's no substitute for a good godly family. Right. You know, I mean, and the impact that a, a good godly family can have or a good godly man or, or woman yeah. it, that fulfills their role well as a man or a woman, it, whether it be in a business, a, a home, a church. I mean, there's a huge need for, for that. Right. Um, the chiefs who did the commencement. Yeah. Who spoke about yeah. That. yeah. I mean, he was right. He was the best. Was yeah. The family and yeah. Yeah. And it's true. I mean, because again, if you get it, and that's that's the theme of Wimpy Week and Woke is is that when you do things God's way, it works. If you go against God's way, it will always fail. It doesn't matter what it is. If you take shortcuts, if you do it a different way, it, it's going to fail. And he's right. And so our culture is trying to do all kinds of things man's way without consulting the handbook, <laughs> and it's not working real well. No, it's and, and it's just going to get messier the further we get away from anything that God designed. Um, all right, number nine was, what do you think of Grudem's explanation between the relationship between the church and Israel? And again, if you disagree with me, please do. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I mean, if you've got biblical reasons. But again, um, d do I, where do you guys line up? I mean, I erased this, but do any of you, um, you probably, you come from all kinds of backgrounds, uh, but I'm just curious, um, how big a deal is this to you, personally? It's a big deal, because I think God is a promise keeper, and He's going to keep His promises to Israel. Okay. To and it's a big deal, because when I hear people who think that way, they diminish the apple of God's eye. Mm -hmm. And that, that bothers me. Yeah. And by the way, you know, it's really interesting. R.C. Sproul, I, I've heard him talk about Israel a lot, a lot more than a lot of, and even though he's post-millennial, post he really loved Israel mm -hmm. and had a lot of, I mean, Ligonier Ministries is one of the most supported ministries in the world. I mean, they, they, they get millions of dollars. Even after he's been dead seven years, they still are doing really well. Um, but he has a lot, of, a lot of Jewish people came to Christ by listening to R.C. Sproul. And he has a deep love for the Jewish people. And it's, but it's just interesting that his eschatology is not dispensational at all. I mean, it's not even close. But he really... And I think it's just because he knew his Old Testament so well, mm -hmm. you know, that he really had a love for the people of Israel and for and for Jewish people. Yeah. And um, but but there's some guys that you see uh, there. I've read quite a few books by by pretty good theologians. I mean, they're not quacks that show over and over again how much anti-Semitism there is among theologians. Right. Yeah, and it's it's wow, it's it's pretty. It is. <laughs> yeah. So I've got I've got several books. I have a doctoral dissertation by somebody who did it on this and he and his he made a case for uh, fi I, I think it was 15 different theologians in the 19th and 20th centuries where he showed uh, several examples of anti-Semitic writing wow. in their writing. And that it was really a pol their political stance that took over their the way they viewed the scriptures. It was really interesting. Um, Luther didn't have much of a no, especially as he got older. It, you know, again, very different from when he was younger. 
But, you know, he, again, nobody, nobody's perfect. I mean, there's no, you're not going to study any. You're not, if you studied my life, you go, whoa, I can't believe he did that. <laughs> I can't believe he thought that. I can't believe he did that. The reality is only Jesus is one perfect. Of, one of the reasons why it's so important <clears throat> is that a bulk of our Bible, in the entire Old Testament, mm -hmm. is about... Mm -hmm. And that's why we need mm -hmm. to know the Old Testament. And the New Testament takes place yeah. in, in Israel until yeah. the diaspora. One thing I would say, too, um, it's really interesting. If you, read, if you were to read 10 books by amillennialists on eschatology, you would probably become an amillennialist. Hmm. If you were, if you read ten books by dispensation, you'd become a dispensational. If you read ten books by postmodern, they make really good arguments. What, what helps is when you read them, critique each other. That's what helps. And so the books that have been the most helpful to me, there's there's two books that are that are called Three Views of the Rapture, that have come out, and then there's two books also that have uh, Four Views of the Millennium. And if you read those books, uh, th there's four of them total. So two on the millennium, two on the on uh, the rapture. Two of those books were written in the '80s. The other two were written in the in about 2010. So they're all different authors. They've interacted with all the best material from the last 60 years, especially. But if you read them, um, it, for me. That's what did it for me, was the, the premillennial, pre-trib, dispensational position in, in all four of those books blew the other guys out of the water. Because what, what they do is, is they take the position and they examine all the relevant scriptures, and then they critique each other on how they handle those scriptures, but they also de then develop a theological basis based on all the scriptures and how all these things fit together. Yeah. And when you do that, to me, the pre premillennial, pre-tribulational, dispensa progressive dispensational position is so good. And the guy, in my opinion, who's the best on all of this stuff is named Craig Blazing. Unfortunately, he hasn't written a lot of books, but he's contributed to, all, to these books, and he's contributed to other books on Israel and the church and whatever. But his articles are phenomenal. phenomenal, And it reminds me that I need to contact him, and if he's not already writing a systematic theology, he needs to write one before he dies. Because I think he's got this subject down better than anybody I've seen. He, he's just phenomenal. So, but again, I've had to wrestle with it. I, different guys have convinced me at different times. And, and for me, if, if I was, what's, what are you guys doing over here? Are you guys getting in trouble? Oh, you, do you need help? This is like, this, this reminds me of when I used to teach junior high. <laughs> and throwing, throwing things. And <laughs> I got Charlie, can you separate them? <laughs> yeah. Because of what you're saying, yeah. there are all these brilliant men right. who wrote books on both sides, or the many sides, right. that I just place myself in the middle because they are all good. Yeah. All of these guys. I yeah. mean, I'd hang out in the seminary reading books, and I'd yeah. think, what the heck are Rooney does? So yeah. you're running over here, yeah. you're running over here, yeah. you're running over here, 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 you R.C. Sproul, Presbyterian, Ligon Duncan, Presbyterian. You'll have these Presbyterians, Baptists, you know, they disagree on the same things I'm disagreeing with here. But again, they all love each other. They're all, they all get along. They're not, you know, they, we agree on so many more things than we disagree on. And so I, that's why I think, again, I, we changed our name from Baptist to Bible. Yeah. And I think it's one of the best things we've ever done. I wanted to do it 10 years ago, but it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have flown. I would have got lynched. Um, I probably shouldn't say that, but <laughs> it's on video. <laughs> Edit that, Charlie. 
No, uh, no, but it doesn't matter because obviously they didn't lynch me now. You know, I mean, it was almost a unanimous vote when we I voted like on. Change because yeah. Having the name Baptist, yeah. there is a stigma. Yeah. There is. And again, if you got a problem with the Bible, then you wouldn't want to come here anyway. I mean, everything we do is is Bible. So, so again, if I want to be called a name or whatever, I don't mind being called biblical. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so, but again, I, I want people who want to get into the Word. I don't care what their background is. And, and if they're coming from a different view or whatever, we hope that they, you can find grace here and work things out. And if you disagree, and, and I'm sure there's people that come here with, you probably disagree with me on certain things, and that's okay. Um, as long as it's not the gospel, as long as it's not like serious stuff that makes you a Christian. Like if any of you said you got to do good works to be saved, well, we're gonna now we got problems, or you know. Jesus isn't the only yeah, or Jesus isn't God, or Jesus yeah. isn't the only way, you know. So there's certain things that are really, really highly important, and then there's things like all these things we're talking about right now. They're important, but yeah. they, we we can we can agree to disagree, and we can get along hopefully. Yeah, you know, just just to your point about guys being on different sides of this. You know, yeah. we, Dave and I were talking about this a few months ago, and, and I, started, I read a couple of books about it. I made some notes on one of the books I read. And the thing I was left with was like, you know, I know supersessionism has been brushed aside and rejected now, okay? But it's really quite extraordinary that that's occurred. Mm -hmm. Because um, the early church established a supersessionist narrative, and this concept continued all the way through the Reformation and into the 20th century. Right. So this was this was the way everybody fought for a long time, centuries. Yeah. And we're talking about people like Barnabas, Justin Martyr, wow. Irenaeus of Lyons, Tertullian, Hippolytus of Rome, Cyprian of Carthage, and then in the Constantine area you have Eusebius, Ambrose of Milan, Jerome, Christostom, and Augustine of Hippo. Wow. So, you know, yeah. some pretty heavy-duty yeah. uh, theologians. Yeah. And Luther, yeah. Calvin, so, Edwards. So, yeah, and that's one of the things I've wrestled with a lot. You know, it's like, these guys are, these are heavy hitters. These guys aren't Benny Hinn, you know, and Joel Stein. I mean, these guys are smart guys who know theology. So, I, I've, believe me, I've really wrestled with that. But, again, I, I, I have to go... Am I convinced biblically? Mm -hmm. So even if I'm going against a lot of time in history, but the thing about eschatology, though, really, is the la it's the last 200 years yeah. where a lot of headway has been made on both sides. And that's why there's even more consensus now than there's ever been, which is really a good thing. Yeah. So, but again, I like the the feel, the dialogue between believer, between evangelical Christians with relationship to what we're talking about. Now, it's way more healthy than it was in the 70s. Um, I think that what's going to happen is we're going to get to heaven or there'll be the rapture and we'll see all of um, the promises and uh, prophecies being fulfilled in yeah. a way that we're going to go, we never oh, did. I yeah. wouldn't have thought. That. Oh, we're yeah, and, and I totally agree. I think we're all, we're all going to be wrong, and sir, I'm going to be wrong. You're going to be wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Blow us away. Yeah, absolutely. That's what he said, but I didn't yeah. get it. But I hope I'm not. I hope you. I hope you hope this for yourself, and I hope this for myself. We're not wrong in too many things, <laughs> and especially the most important right. ones. But again, that's why we're here. That's why we study. That's why we we we, we do believe that truth matters, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, and that we're 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 pursuing the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, stuff. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, number ten: the church is the bride of Christ, and he brought the church. He bought the church with his blood. Does your love for the church reflect the love God has for the church? Now, this is personal, okay? <laughs> but I think these are good questions to think about. Um, and then uh, number 11, if you're a Christian, are you meaningfully committed to the local church? If so, how has this been a benefit to you? If not, what have you been missing out on according as you read this chapter? And then number 12, is there one metaphor that the Bible uses for the church that is especially helpful to you? And what is it about that one that makes it so? So for, I think that'd be a good way, way to close is, 
Uh, if each of us could just share, you know, what, what metaphor stands out for you personally that helps you to understand how you're a part of the church and how the church benefits from you and you benefit from the church? Yeah, the body of Christ. Okay. The concept of uh, all the parts being necessary for the body to work together. Well, yeah. Good, yeah. And uh, my desire to be a part of that body is very strong. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's great. You know, and even in, the, in just this room, all of us are very different. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're unified in what we believe about Jesus. We, we want to know the truth of the word. But we're very di different yeah. backgrounds, different skills, different spiritual gifts. And yet we all benefit from each other, right? Mm -hmm. And that's just a wonderful thing. As a matter of fact, no, I don't think any of us would know each other if it wasn't for Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I might have run into Charlie on a golf course somewhere, maybe, you know, or, yeah. <laughs> well, I, the, yeah. The part that works for me really is the family. Mm -hmm. It's supportive. It's nurturing. Um, they teach. The family um, uh, re teaches. It's a place to belong. It raises up people in the way they should go. Mm -hmm. um, the, in the nurture and the admonition of the word. Um, there's the fellowship, there's comfort, there's discipline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and recreating. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of, and lot of good things. A lot of good things. Yeah. Yeah, and, and some of us have experienced where we're closer to people in a, in a church body like ours than even a biological family members. You know, there's just, there's such a unity that you have in Christ and bond and like-mindedness and and it's wonderful wonderful to be able to have that especially in such a challenging world in which we live but it's geographically yeah. closer too because my family yeah is yeah yeah absolutely how about you dana what which one which metaphor stands out the most for you you think that you identify with? the bride of christ okay i just i love being a bride i love that he loves us um just so unconditionally, and I love the fact that loving his bride, that he will come and rescue us mm -hmm. before the tribulation, and he will take his bride, the church, to be with him where he is, and he will save her from that because she is not, you know, set forward for condemnation. You know, yeah. There's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. So I just feel like that's such an exciting thing um, that, you know, he's the groom and he's going to come get his bride and take her to be with him. And yeah. She will not have to go through the Good. Population. Good. How about you, Blanca? So what Walter said, very much so, being the, the body that, and again, for me, it's the connection that I cannot function without a foot and arm and leg mm -hmm. and I, I can't. I cannot function by myself. Yeah. I need the whole body. Yeah. Good. Good. How about you, Charlie? I'd say maybe a sports team. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because you got the coach. Yeah. And everybody plays better because they're together. You know, if you got uh -huh. kind of like a soccer player, like kicking a ball against the wall, he's going to get to a certain level, and that's that. But being around, being around other yeah. other people, uh, it's because he's going to be better, and there's an objective. Yeah, there's yeah. An objective to win, an objective to achieve a goal. Yeah, yeah. The picture we have for our membership class is our is a rowing crew, you know, <laughs> and I love that picture because. Uh, again, if you got one person rolling that way and everyone this way, and it got, I mean, you're, just, you're going in circles, you know, you're, you're not going to get anywhere. But man, if you're all on the same, there was a movie we just watched, uh, The Boys in the Boat. Did you? Yeah. yeah, it was a good book. And, and then they did a movie on it, but The Boys in the Boat it was on the rowing team from Was University of Washington that went to the Olympics and yeah I think so the 20s or 30s yeah it was around it was yeah but anyway really good movie but but that's the idea you know it's just that they're all in sync they're working as a team and I love you know I love that whole idea as well um, and again I, I that's sort of the way I see Jesus and the disciples you know he's he's the coach or pastor um, and they follow him 
-hmm. but he models for them what to do and and they were all very different you know i mean peter peter's very different than you know they, they all stand out in different ways and uh and that's and that's the beauty of the church is that god can use all of us and he does and so so anyway good chapter and so next time we get together we're looking at um let's see what's the title the purity and unity of the church okay so that's going to be our next chapter and I I really liked him. yeah Rudum was uh when he was talking about keeping the purposes in balance uh -huh. and uh, the need for the church to uh, accomplish all of the different balanced things, yeah. but that each person doesn't have to be involved yeah. heavily in every single one of those. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to keep a balanced life and do all right. the things that the church does. I just can't do it. I can't function yeah. that way. Yeah. But I can function and be really good in one part of it. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a really good point. Really like really yeah. Yeah, thanks for bringing that out. I, I think that's incredibly important. <laughs> when I was in Bible college, it was so funny because every chapel speaker was pas you know, passionate about their subject. So you'd have like a missionary from China come. And like, I, you know, when, when it was over, it's like, okay, God wants me to go to China. <laughs> you know? And then the next person was come and they're working in the streets of Portland. You know, I mean, it's like, and you want to do everything, you know, but you can't. And, and you're not necessarily good at everything either. So. And you're not cool. Yeah, but I think uh, one of the best leadership principles I ever learned is that if you ex the worst thing you could possibly do is expect everyone to be like you. Uh -huh. yeah. um, wow. And if you're a good leader knows what it, the strengths and weaknesses of those people are, and you maximize their strengths and you minimize their weaknesses. And, and how you staff a church or a business, I think, should be the same way. You know, you, you get the best people you can. And, and build it around those best people. And that may mean you look different than someone else, but again, you, you want good quality people. And God's in the, again, I don't lose sleep at night. You know, when we get behind on the budget or whatever, there were, there's been times in the past where I'd lose sleep over stuff like that. But after I went through cancer, I just realized, you know what? This is God's church and he cares about it more than I do. <laughs> so, I'm gonna get, so I'm gonna let him deal with the fact that you know, we need more money or more leaders or whatever. I'm going to sleep. You know, God, you take, God, you take care of this. You know, and He always does. You know, He He always does. I'm behind in July and yeah. September, but by the time December rolls around, it yeah. all comes up. It usually does. Yeah. So, but again, you know, it's just I, I just love the. You know, we've talked about this. God's sovereignty. You know, um, just how 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 much peace that gives us you know but again we have to be reminded of it you know every day but uh thank god you know it's it's our government isn't in control of everything or you know um god but god is and he's gonna work everything out 